Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everybody joining us for today's webinar on future proofing our institution. This series is being brought to us by the IMAC's Yorkshire Group and today in collaboration with the London Young Members Panel, we'll be covering a topic very close to some of our hearts. Social mobility is an aspect of diversity and inclusion initiatives in engineering that has not seen nearly as much coverage as others such as gender and race. And today we're delighted to shed some light on it. My name's Myra and I'm joined by some brilliant panelists, including working engineers and experts in the field of social mobility and accessibility. So a quick introduction to everybody on the call. We have Helena Rivers from AECOM, Chris Jane from TFL, Pierre French from Huddersfield University, Emma Dizerins from Engineering UK, and Sarah Crossan from the Social Mobility Foundation. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I should let you know that this session is being recorded and will be shared on the IMECI's DNDI webpage next week. Now, before we introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in a quick poll. Um, the question we're asking you today is, how would you rate your current awareness, pre-webinar, um, around social mobility issues? And the options we're giving you are that you could be unclear on the definition, aware of the issue, keen to be actively involved, but unclear as to how, or maybe you are already actively involved in initiatives. Whichever of these you fall into, we'd like to encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar by typing into the Q&A box you'll see on your screen. You can also use this box to submit any technical issues and our team will pick it up. So now I'd like to introduce you to Helena Rivers. Helena is a director of AECOM working within the construction sector. And as a trustee of the institution and vice chair of our DNI committee, she's perfectly placed to deliver our keynote address this afternoon. Welcome, Helena. Thank you, Ira. Um, I'm really excited that we're delivering the second in this series of D diversity and inclusion webinars and I hope it will be the second of many. Within the world of professional engineering, we often focus on the inclusion challenges which are most visible to us. Shortage of women engineers, BAME engineers, and engineers with physical disabilities. Today, however, we're focused on a very important subject of social mobility. COVID has changed everything about how we live, work, and learn. We've all had to adapt at an unprecedented rate. There'll always be consequences of such rapid, unplanned change, now our children are back at their schools and universities, and it's clear that the majority of us will be working predominantly from home for the next six months at least. A light has been shone on the different opportunities offered to school children, students, and developing engineers, depending on their home situations and their ability to study, learn, and develop at home. Now's the time to discuss social mobility within engineering and look at how we can adapt to support those who need it most. Today, we should all ask ourselves some difficult questions. Are we doing our bit to ensure that people's backgrounds don't limit their opportunities within the profession? Is there more we could be do to create a more level playing field? Are we displaying unconscious bias in recruitment for educational backgrounds like our own? Social mobility is a huge challenge. Successive governments have run initiatives to improve the chances of our most disadvantaged youngsters, all with some limited success. If there's a silver bullet, no one has found it yet. We're fortunate within engineering professions to have a strong history of apprenticeships. Ever increasingly, these are a degree level apprenticeships with those apprentices completing their programs with both a degree and that really valuable on the job experience, ready to deliver and subsequently lead engineering projects. Yet only 39% of those from disadvantaged backgrounds reach managerial or professional roles compared to 71 of those from advantage backgrounds. As we hear from our panellists today, I hope we can shine a light on what some of those unseen blockers are. Yesterday, Boris announced significant investment in further education and support for those who don't attend university, a positive step in these difficult times. Within the institution, we're really fortunate to have our wonderful support network. It's funded by the voluntary donations from our members paid along with our annual subscriptions. The work that the support network does is often unseen, but they can and do make a real difference to the lives of many. 
They offer training, emotional support, and indeed financial support to our members and their dependents when they're most in need. Please do look into their services and re recommend them to your fellow engineers who are having a tough time right now. Finally, this week is National Inclusion Week, a week designed to celebrate inclusion in all its forms. The theme this year is Each One Reach One, and if each of us on this webinar today reaches out and offers someone support or spreads the inclusion message collectively, we'll have a huge positive impact. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Um, that was a really lovely note to conclude on. Um, we are going to be expanding upon a lot of these points during the webinar, but um, for our audience, you should be able to see the poll results at the moment. And a bit like what I would have suspected, um, a lot of us listening to the panelists today are not necessarily particularly familiar with the issues surrounding social mobility and engineering. Um, so I would like to address my first question to Sarah, who is a program coordinator at the Social Mobility Foundation. Sarah, you've spent your career working with hundreds of students who face barriers due to their socioeconomic background. Could you please give us an insight into the depth of the issue and how well or potentially how poorly our engineering industries have dealt with it? Thanks, Myra. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to give um, a little bit of background to the SMF, the Social Mobility Foundation, we work with these young people who are high achieving, but from a low income or disadvantaged background. Um, and our aim is to give them the networks and knowledge that they lack due to this background so that they're equipped to be able to achieve their aspirations, enter top universities and the profession of their choice. Um, so we have um, a few slides, which I think are going to appear very shortly, um, which will give you some context to the reason we exist as a charity and why work on social mobility is so necessary. So um, once these slides appear, you should be able to see um, the, the proportions of people in elite professions and high level roles are entirely unre unrepresentative of the country at large. Um, Oxford and Cambridge are routinely considered the first port of call for employers who are looking for the cream of the crop of recent graduates. However, more students from eight schools end up at Oxbridge than are admitted from almost 3,000 other schools altogether. Even if you are bright, able and ambitious, you if you're from a low income background, you're more likely to earn less than your lower ability peers from advantage backgrounds throughout the course of your career. So background still has um, a big impact on your earnings. And the influence and impact of parental occupation remains a big factor. Students who are achieving all A stars in their A levels are up against those who have parents who are doctors. The latter are 24 times more likely to end up in that job rather than the student who has the necessary capabilities but has not been born to a doctor. If you can see these slides, uh, on the second one, we have some uh, other information. So your personal connections in engineering, although they don't matter quite as much as they do in other sectors, so it's not as bad as the medicine world, it, they still have an impact on whether you will become an engineer. So you are three times more likely to be an engineer if one of your parents are. Having said that, engineering is one of the science professions that has a slightly more equitable spread of employees based on family background. Um, and you can see that over a fifth of the workforce have parents from a working class background, and it's much more evenly spread across professionals, middle class and lower class than other sciences. Um, as well as the graduate routes into engineering, it is a sector with quite a lot of apprenticeship opportunities, as Helena mentioned, compared to other uh, industries. And we'll speak a bit more about those, I think, a little later on. But a survey by Universities UK found that of degree apprentices at the institutions they surveyed, a fifth were on engineering courses. So quite a bulk of the apprentices on those degree level apprenticeships were in engineering. However, there is still a divide between those who are likely and less likely to take on higher level apprenticeships. One factor is physical access. So disadvantaged young people in lower areas of employment or rural areas are less likely to have multiple high level apprenticeships available to them. Um, and on the last slide that we have, 
you'll see the top uh, 75 businesses as ranked by the Social Mobility Employer Index in 2019. Um, there were only a small number of engineering companies who entered the index last year. And as far as I have seen, Arup was the only one to feature in the top 75. So if you are looking for um, a way to explore how you can uh, improve social mobility in your employer, that is a fantastic um, resource and uh, ranking tool for you. As well as information on how candidates are recruited, how they're assessed, the employer index also asks about whether people feel a sense of belonging in the workplace. And this is something really important when we're talking about class um, and asks about perceptions relating to class. It found that twice as many working class respondents in last year's employee survey um, found that they needed to hide their class background to get ahead in the workplace than those who were middle class. Um, as I've mentioned, there's less chance of someone from a lower socioeconomic background getting into top employers in elite professions. Those who are in multiple underrepresented groups face further barriers, such as those who are black, Asian or of a minority ethnicity. And for all people, especially with those with added disadvantage, seeing and meeting people like themselves can have a huge impact. It's worth remembering that your socioeconomic background doesn't stop becoming a factor once you enter the workforce. There are lots of things that employers can and are doing to remove any barriers. Um, hopefully that gives you a sense of the issue of social mobility, a few things about what engineering is doing at the moment, how um, we can all do more. And I will now hand back to Myra. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it seems like we may have had a little bit of a techie glitch um, with regards to the slides being shared, but we can make those available later. But it's so interesting to note that engineering is actually quite a viable career path, and this is likely down to the prevalence of engineering apprenticeships. Um, but I find myself thinking that while apprenticeships are a fantastic route into engineering, I feel like the decision on whether to go to university or pursue an apprenticeship should be based on a student's strengths, interests, skill set, academic preferences, not a decision made for them by their socioeconomic background. So my question is, do we do enough as a society and as an institution to actively promote this differentiation? Or are we perpetuating a notion that well-off students go to university and those from low-income households go into the workplace? Uh, yeah, so it's Emma from Engineering UK. I think there's quite a lot to unpick on that one. So access to higher education isn't equal to everybody, unfortunately. Uh, academic performance by social class is a long-standing issue and one that has been made worse by the pandemic and recent events. Um, and there was a Sutton Trust study a few years ago about the negative perceptions of vocational routes. And it's, it found that only a fifth of teachers would advise a high-performing student to opt for an apprenticeship over university. And obviously with the rising costs of tuition fees and the cap on places at universities, there's other issues um, in terms of attending a higher education institute. Um, apprenticeships do seem like a really good solution, but it is worth pointing out that they do rely on a strong job market. And again, with the pandemic and everything going on at the moment, that's not something that is necessarily guaranteed at the moment. Um, and there is also a geographical element. Um, there's apprenticeship cold spots and they tend to be in areas with high levels of unemployment and deprivation. So many disadvantaged young people just don't have access to them. Um, so there's a lot to unpick um, beyond just the kind of societal perceptions of it. But I think the most important thing is that we ensure that all young people have access to the information so that they can make informed choices about what the best steps for them are. Hi, it's Chrisma here. I thought I'd like to reflect on my own experiences. Um, And I think for me to reflect on that question, years ago, I thought it was 15, but it's not. For me back then, um, it was fees were much lower. Um, I took a, a covered my fees and it covered um, my living expenses. And for me, reflecting on that, 
Um, I had those opportunities back then. If I was to be in the same situation today, I'm not sure I would be able, with the support of my parents, be able to afford to go to university. So um, I think for me, I for me. So I, I think for me, in terms of the institution, it's what what can we do to kind of make sure that, that divide isn't there? What, what can we do going forwards? Thanks, Prisma, for your um, personal experience. Um, it, it's Helena here. Um, I think there's there's a number of things that, that we can do and, and that we are doing. Um, so back in 2015, the institution um, published a report um, on social mobility um, with some key recommendations, which really focused on um, the provision of structured careers advice and that recognition that there are different routes um, to careers and, and what those different routes entail. Um, and, and for that to be possible for um, the support to, to teachers, um, enabling them to go out into um, actual work environments to understand what those opportunities are so that they are able to pass on the appropriate advice. Um, um, so, so a lot around, around that um, careers education piece. I mean, also in a very practical sense, um, I mentioned um, in, at, at this, in my keynote, around the support network and you know for a limited number of people financial support can be made available to to help people through university um, clearly we can't support everyone um, but it is something that the institution can do to, to help a few thank you very much um, so we have a question from the audience um, for Emma uh, how mobile is the population who are in the apprenticeship cold spots? Could they relocate for jobs? And that's a question from Jill. It's it's a difficult one to answer. And it depends, again, on their financial situations, whether they've got someone they could stay with or whether they could rent, etc. And um, for a lot of people, if they're not in a position to move location themselves, then it's about what um, what industry is available on their doorstep and the apprenticeships that they offer. Um, so someone could be particularly interested in a particular subject, but not have access to an apprenticeship in that subject on their doorstep. So again, it's difficult with the geography and, and the possibility to move, particularly at the moment, <laughs> is a lot harder. Thank you. Um, so staying on the topic of um, apprenticeships and university, um, once we've seen uni students and apprentices graduate, they're in the workplace together, sometimes doing the same job. I want to know what the panel thinks of how we treat them differently. How do we as an institution treat incorporated engineers compared with chartered? How do their employers respond to such qualifications in terms of promotion and pay rises? In other words, how socially mobile does the apprenticeship route actually allow you to be? It's Emma again, I'm just going to start off if that's okay. Um, I think the answer to that is it depends on the level of the apprenticeship that is um, undertaken. So I think there's been some studies recently that say someone with a level five apprenticeship, which is a kind of degree level apprenticeship, um, has average earnings, which is larger than someone from a Russell Group graduate. Um, but there are distinct uh, differences in the people who take up those higher level um, apprenticeships. So disadvantaged young people are a lot less likely to take up the best apprenticeships. Um, and for those who do choose to do an apprenticeship, they're more likely to be working at that kind of level two or level three apprenticeship, which is a GCSE or A-level equivalent. And obviously then in terms of the career progression and opportunities, they're not the same, um, certainly immediately um, when they go into the workplace. Hi, it's Chrisma here. Uh, I think I do have some connection issues, so hopefully uh, you can hear me. Mira, if you just just want to just reflecting you to those back in the, I, I think I have connection issues. Can you hear me? 
Okay. I'm going to carry on in and out. Shall I try I, I one think more? If we, if, we, if we pop over to Pierre and we'll try yeah, and sort out sure. your issues on the side. Sure. Pierre? Oh, right, I'm uh, here. You are um, still muted. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, I spent uh, many years recruiting graduates um, for the company that I worked for. It's a large multinational, but we were a division of that. And, um, um, you know, what I found was the easiest thing to do is to do what others were saying, which is to pick the top graduates from the top university who have got their the quickest and with the highest grades. Um, but when you look at how people m moved in the company, what you tended to find was that the people who'd come through an apprenticeship graduate um, route to get a degree um, tended to stay on the operations side. And the people that you brought in ended up in R&D and design and doing some all, all of that sort of thing. And inside the company, there was very little exchange between those two, two groups. So two distinct groups. Um, and my my um, thought was that it's not only the degree that you've got and how it's perceived, but it's also the aspirations of the individuals too. I think people who come up through the apprentice train thing see a world, the world of operations, and then that becomes their comfort zone, and it becomes where they want to develop their careers. Um, and that is, is different if you've done a, um, a degree after A levels and gone straight into industry. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we have any data on that, but I think that would be very interesting to look at at some point. Thank you, Pierre. From from you, the point of view of your question around how we um, treat incorporated and chartered engineers, it's Helena speaking now. Um, uh, I think the institution has done a lot over the last um, five years to um, improve the perceived um, status of incorporated engineers. And in fact, there is no, no difference in treatment within the institution between incorporated and chartered engineers. The challenge is um, that a change in society is a generational shift rather than something which can be um, immediately impacted. Um, and what the, we need to do more to publicize it, absolutely recognize that. I think, you know, we've taken the first steps um, in terms of the, the status recognition um, and we need to continue to work on communicating that more broadly that actually both are equivalent routes to um, achieving um, that that's professional status. Hi, Sarah here. Just to finish up on that one and really kind of echo what Helena said. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, engineering is making really positive steps in the fact that it constitutes quite a high proportion of those higher level apprenticeships. And I think it's um, it's making moves in definitely the right direction in terms of the parity and progression between graduate route and apprenticeship routes. So in terms of Mara, when you asked about how socially mobile does that apprenticeship route allow you to be, I think if you are able to access a higher level apprenticeship and it's in a, an industry such as engineering, which gives that the recognition it deserves, then it could allow you to be as socially mobile as the graduate route. That's really positive to know, Sarah. Um, I have a question coming in for Helena, but I wonder if it's, it's more of just a very insightful comment. Um, so recognizing the issues of university and ed educational degree access, should engineers in industry and the IMECI concentrate on ensuring and enhancing social mobility in industry? My perception is that with requirements for academic qualifications for chartership and less use of part-time degrees, social mobility in engineering has got weaker in the last 30 years. Um, I guess we've we've kind of covered that, um, but 
Helena, do you have anything extra to add? I mean, it is definitely a challenge um, and one which, you know, as I said, we don't have a silver bullet answer for. I, 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 my perception is that it, it hasn't got worse in the last 30 years and I'd be interested in Sarah and Emma's view on the same question. Um, I do think one advantage that we do have where people do follow that um, apprenticeship education route um, and are ending up with the ING -ENG qualifications is that it's recognised throughout industry and in terms of um, career progression, it's a really important milestone. Um, and actually, in some ways, the apprentices have got that huge advantage of the work experience as well as the academic qualifications to enable them to achieve those milestones, which are very often um, connected with uh, significant pay rises within a lot of organisations. So, I mean, yes, education isn't the only answer. Um, yes, there's always more that we can do. Um, and we'll talk more about um, what we're looking at doing within the institution as we go on through this this webinar. Um, um, but I still think that that is an important question to to look at the, the standardisation where it's possible. Emma and Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? Specifically, I guess, with regards to that perception of 30 years, because it is very subjective. I think potentially um, with, I mean, I'm no, by no means an expert on engineering specifically or the industry, but um, with the move with a lot of industries to um, introduce graduate schemes and graduate level um, programs for people, um, by doing that, it obviously um, limits in some ways who can apply for those. And I think it's perhaps worth um, looking into who actually gets into like um, Thomas has said the like the issues of getting into university and getting that degree education and I think that's contributed to the perception of the difference between apprentices and graduates perhaps over the last few decades because those who, those who are coming out of university with the fantastic degrees and um, getting onto graduate schemes aren't necessarily going to be the best people that academic attainment and prior attainment doesn't necessarily um predict potential to do the job and so i think um it's maybe a sort of bigger issue than engineering almost in that um universities i noticed somebody asked about universities and what they're doing they are also doing a lot of work to make sure they widen the diversity of who is actually getting in um, and so that we don't have that advantage people do the graduate schemes, less advantage people do the apprenticeships sort of binary. Um, I don't know if Emma has anything else to add on that. I hope that was useful. No, I don't, I don't think I've got anything to add. That was really clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I hope that covers the question um, put to us by our audience. Um, following on from it, I'm aware that the IMECI does a lot to promote inclusion, but what more could the IMECI do essentially to be more inclusive in itself with regards to social mobility? Um, thanks, Maya. I'll pick that up. It's Helena again. Um, um, and it is a very topical question. Um, the institution is striving to be a more inclusive organisation, as you say. It's reflected in all that we're doing from our building to our messaging and our activities. Um, we're in the process of developing a new diversity and inclusion strategy to emphasise the importance of inclusivity and demonstrate that we're taking action rather than just talking. Um, but we need um, input from all of our membership and indeed wider society to understand what the challenges are which are being faced. In developing our strategy, we've engaged widely with membership to, to get feedback, to understand what the challenges are and what the barriers are which people are facing out in industry. And I encourage anyone who's listening to this who's um, identified particular um, challenges to, to feed into us, um, to, to, to to advise us what it is that you think that we're missing so that we can um, develop it into our strategy. We can't do everything in the short term, but if it's in the strategy, we will do everything we can in the long term.
That sounds brilliant. Thank you, Helena. So as with most things diversity and inclusion based, I find myself asking to exact change is the onus on us as individuals, <coughs> excuse me, um, the professional institutions or employers? Excuse me again. Um, Pierre, you were heavily involved in community-based initiatives during your career, and you were actively supported and encouraged by your employer at the time. My question for you is, what schemes can engineering firms implement and how effective can these be? Yes, firstly, the company I work for um, had social inclusion as part of people's everyday work, and they made um, community action, as it was called, um, it was put in people's work plans. And uh, you could spend a certain amount of time um, working in the community on three three basic three basic um, initiatives education disability and disadvantage and what we did was we formed relationships with the local schools in the more uh, deprived areas of Huddersfield uh, and the local area um, and we developed um, a number of uh, things that we did in those schools to try and raise the aspirations of the students there. But the really good thing was that it had a huge impact on the employees too, because um, you know many of them liked, just like to do this. Others got diversity and social diversity experiences they wouldn't have had in a, any other way. And the other remarkable thing was you'd find that the person who just came in from nine to five um, every day had all sorts of skills that they used outside of work that suddenly became revealed. Um, and so um, it's a good thing. You can make the business case for inclusion, uh, including um, diversity initiatives. Um, and you can do things like uh, you develop skills in schools. Uh, you, you spot local talent. You can spot some of the local students early and um, uh, work with them. It engenders loyalty in the local community for the company lowers recruiting costs and apart from that it's the right thing to do people felt that well this is the right thing to do this is the way that that it should work so what sort of things did we do we um we managed to negotiate to get people on the governing bodies of some of the local local education institutes uh, we set up a direct link to help uh, a school for disabled children locally um, we did work shadowing. We, we would bring students, um, you know, at GCSE level, level and come and have them spend a day or two or three days in the, in the workplace working with someone and showing them what, what the world of work was all like. Um, we had a get up and go weekend one, one weekend. We um, put a load of activities into the plant where we were and we invited the students in to, to do these activities and at the end we gave them a certificate saying that they had completed that it was something they could say they could have done in the in the real world uh, we did things like help su direct um, um, support the curriculum so we'd look at um, some of the facilities that we had and we'd um, our students we'd work with the teachers and say well we could do this for them if you brought them in uh, and give them a lesson or, or show them an experiment or something like that uh, and then the other thing was we did make a small amount of funding for th for things that they wanted to do. So maybe la like a trip to, to a science museum or something like that. Now, this works for a large company quite well, um, and it wouldn't work in the same way for small companies. But I think it would be worth um, people looking and seeing how community, local community action can actually help your business in some way. Um, there are some watchouts, though, and I, some of these have been learned the, the painful way. One is if you're in an educational institution, don't pretend you know how to manage their institution or educate people. Um, you know, you don't want to be arrogant about what um, what industry what industry is. You're there to help them and they set the agenda. That's very important. So don't tell them how to run their business or how to teach. Um, you do get priority clashes and you've got to limit the number of hours or the amount of time that gets put in. 
Um, but you know, like um, an hour a week or uh, an hour and a half a week, um, you can normally accommodate. The other thing is that you find that people will start putting their own time into the company and into the um, the organization that you're supporting. You actually get more hours out of people, but in a slightly different way. Um, so we spent, um, I spent a lot of time helping organize that and actually chaired the, um, the committee that ran that in, in, in the company I was working for. Um, but I say that that was an exception, but it's worth looking at those sorts of initiatives. Um, and my one takeaway would be um, go and talk to the people in the local schools and in the local areas and see how you can help them. Pia, yeah, that is fantastic advice. And it's actually, it's covered one of the questions that um, we had shortlisted to ask. Um, and the question was, could mentoring for apprentice trained engineers help bridge the aspiration gap that you had raised? Um, but there's also a follow up part to it, which is, does the IMECI provide external mentors for people who cannot find one within their working environment? Um, so I think if Helena could take that one, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that will be a very brief, yes, we do. Um, I mean, it, it is, there's a long answer and a short answer. The short answer is yes, we do support people who are unable to identify mentors. Um, we used to have quite extensive mentoring programs, but with very little take up. Um, and uh, much to my surprise that there was little take up. Um, so we're interested in feedback if anyone knows why that would be. Does anyone else on the panel have an insight on that one? Hi, it's Chris here. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, so I, I think for me, I, I absolutely agree with Pierre and I think lots of employers um, individually, we do quite a lot in terms of engaging with people from disadvantaged backgrounds and work with schools. I think for me, um, employers do things um, individually. What I think what I'd like as, what I'd like to see is working with the institutions a little bit more and collaborating so that we're all working towards the same goal. But I find that we're sometimes trying to do things individually, whereas if we work together a little bit more, we might be able to, I don't know, cover more ground. Um, but yeah, absolutely agree with um, Pierre's comments. Uh, it, Pierre here, can I just jump in there a little bit? I think if there is a company in a town, people and students will identify with that company much more quickly than they will with the IMECE, okay? And maybe the way to do it is through companies rather than directly from the institution. You might find that there's more connectivity somehow. That would be my thought on that. Sure. I think that's a great insight, Pierre. I'm going to, we're going to go back a little bit um, before we get on to the next main topic, um, because we have a question from the audience um, and it's um, aimed at Helena again, uh, because some engineering institutions regard incorporated engineer status as a step to achieving chartered engineer status. How does the IMECI regard this approach? So essentially is CNG the goal or is ING also considered a goal as opposed to a stepping stone to chartership? So um, ING is also considered a goal, um, a normal career progression or membership progression through the institution um, would be from ING to being a fellow. There's no, no route that takes you via um, CNG as well. Um, I do recognise that it's not the same across all the PEIs and, and the, uh, SIBC is an example I can think of, which is exactly as, as you suggest in the question. Um, but yeah, no, with, within IMECI, um, you know, they, they're the equivalent qualifications and we wouldn't expect members to be doing both. And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit with this one. Can you envisage a time where the IMECI would maybe readdress the way we differentiate between them and 
make it possible for you to go from incorporated to chartered if there was sufficient feedback from the well, the general IMECI members to say we don't see the equality where there should be the equality. I think absolutely. We, we're on a journey right now as an institution. We're in a time of great change and um, the industry is changing. The role of professional institutions is changing. And if our membership model should, should change to address those changing needs, then we would be open to considering it. It would be a big change, though. It's not something that's going to happen um, um, in a short time frame. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your answer, Helena. Um, the next topic of conversation is one that is affecting us all at the moment, but some more than others. I'd like to start by directing this to Emma due to the extensive research you've been doing at Engineering UK. How has the pandemic affected the career aspirations of young people? And does your answer change depending on their socioeconomic backgrounds? Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, Engineering UK have recently conducted a survey of 11 to 19 year olds and just published a report called Young People and COVID-19, which is looking at the career aspirations and experiences of young people. Um, and there are a few key takeaways from that. So at the moment, it seems that young people are concerned that going to uni um, or becoming an apprentice and getting a job has become more difficult as a result of the pandemic. Um, and job security and availability were factors that were commonly reported by young people as being more important since the pandemic. Um, it has resulted in young people being more interested in a career in STEM, which is great, um, but interest in engineering is lagging slightly behind science and technology. Um, the careers advice during lockdown that people have sought has predominantly come in the form of searching for information online or speaking to parents. So in terms of social mobility, we know that that potentially has got an issue because obviously there's a digital divide. Um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds have less access to devices or, or internet, et cetera. Um, and if their parents or their adults at home have got high science capital, they're more likely to be able to influence them towards the career in STEM. Um, there was also a recent study, I think it was a couple of days ago, that was released by the Prince's Trust, which was looking at, again, um, aspirations of young people. And I think it found that 44% um, of young people believe that their future goals now seem impossible to achieve, but that number rises to 50% if they're from poorer backgrounds. Um, so definitely an impact on those young people who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Hi, um, it's Sarah here. Just to add to um, what Emma has already said, um, in terms of the young people we support in our programme, we haven't at the moment, although their ideas of what's possible for them has changed, we haven't seen any significant reductions in their engagement with our support. So we offer things like skills sessions, mentoring, opportunities to speak to professionals. Um, and in fact, it's slightly increased in some areas as uh, the students are taking all they can from the opportunities they have at the moment without being in school and college. Um, they're making the most of the support they have. I think it's interesting um, the things Emma pointed out about their perceptions of the job industry, what's important to them in the future. And I think they recognise that things will be harder for them as a result of the pandemic. It's perhaps not necessarily that their aspirations have changed, but it's more of a case that the environment, that environment around them is changing the opportunities for them. So I think it's potentially worth bearing that in mind that they as people haven't changed their ambition and aspiration, but they do acknowledge that it's gonna be harder for them to get where they want to go. Thank you, Emma and Sarah. Um, so still relating to COVID-19, uh, this is one I feel particularly passionate about. For a lot of us, the national lockdown was a frightening time, regardless of our social mobility. However, there is little doubt that the underprivileged would have struggled more. My question is, given how much charitable work the IMECI does with schools, what did we as an institution do and what could we do next time when it's no longer an unprecedented event to make life easier for children studying from home? some of whom are on the poverty line, some of whom may not even have access to a computer. 
Um, to answer from the institution side, it's Helena again. Um, um, so what the institution did is we launched a new web page called STEM at Home and um, the um, activities that our STEM ambassadors typically take out into schools but were unable to um, uh, provide it on that website. There's the opportunity for those who don't have um, regular online access to um, get kits sent to their home with the instructions included for each of those activities. Um, it, it's not as good as seeing real engineers going and engaging with students, but in terms of um, a solution that worked in the socialized, socially isolated period, um, I, I hope that we were able to touch um, the lives of a lot of young people. And, and it is worth noting that, you know, the IMEC -E did that. The other PEIs did very similar um, processes also. Oh, yeah, on a small scale at Engineering UK, we're a small organisation, but we had a few spare laptops and we made sure that they were sent out to um, the local community or schools within our local area to support uh, young people in having access to technology. Um, and I know that we're not the only organisation that did that. So some of our corporate members were doing the same. And I think there's a um, there's a platform, I think it's through business in the community, which matches um, industry or, or organisations with local community groups um, who need support. So that's quite a good way of, of working out how you can help as well. That's brilliant. So if you are a CEO of a decent sized corporation listening to this now, um, you can go onto the Engineering UK website and that's the best way to find your local initiative. It's not on the Engineering UK website. I think it's through business in the community business in the community. Thank you, Emma. Sarah, did you have anything to add on that one? Yes, yeah, sure. This is Sarah. Um, so we um, took a survey at the start of lockdown back in March of the students on our programme because we knew that we would have to move a lot of our support online. It's normally delivered at in-person events a lot of the time. And um, so we asked them what they have access to. And we found that only, um, only two thirds of them, so a third of them didn't have shared or any access to a computer at home. Um, however, 98% said they had a smartphone and some uh, internet access, whether that was limited data, unlimited data, strong or weak Wi-Fi. And when we started running our online webinars, we, we ran a lot of our support via webinar. And um, around a third of students each time were joining on a smartphone rather than on a laptop, as I'm sure many people are today. So we had to try and think of ways in which we could make the webinars as accessible on a smartphone as well as a laptop or a computer. And we haven't found all the solutions to that by any means, but it's something we're definitely thinking about when we plan our interactivity, what functions we use, whether these are available on a smartphone, um, how people can, whether they can download a recording and watch offline later if they have limited data and all those kinds of things. So um, if um, if you're delivering something online, it's, it's maybe a good idea to try and get a sense of how people might access it and that can help. And um, that really has helped us figure out how to best support our students. It's, it's Helena again here. Thank you, um, and as Sarah mentioned in discussion about the, the value of um, at, at, um, material which can be accessed via smartphones. Um, so I have checked and the iMechE STEM at home um, activities can be watched on a smartphone. I'm pleased to advise. That is very good news. Um, so the next question I have is, well, for me, one of the interesting things about social mobility from a diversity and inclusion perspective is that it is a consideration that should be quite easy to incorporate alongside other D&I activities. For instance, um, if you want to promote engineering to young girls, um, that could involve a conscious decision to address schools in disadvantaged neighborhoods. So you cover your gender diversity and your social mobility. I'd like to gauge from Sarah, 
how we as individual volunteers can work with initiatives such as the Social Mobility Foundation to make our endeavours more effective. Absolutely. Um, so working on, like you say, working on diversity within class um, can definitely come alongside diversity in many other areas. And I've sort of thought about three main options um, because there are a whole lo load of things that people could do. Um, so to find out a bit more about where you could target those diversity and inclusion activities, um, if you're not already in partnership with a charity like the Social Mobility, Mobility Foundation, for example, but you already have activities running that you want to just reach to more people, you could look for areas um, either near you or further away that are less socially mobile and focus on those. So there are lists that have been published um, by the government's Social Mobility Commission. They've recently released a summary of um, the least and most socially mobile areas in England. And some of those are not necessarily the most or least deprived, um, but it's a, it's a really interesting list to look at. Um, or you could speak to a local authority or a council about which schools or communities have more people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in your area so if you have an activity you already know you're running it in various schools and you just want to expand that that could be a good way to do so and um, secondly if you are someone who's looking to set something up with colleagues or again develop what you already have um, the social mobility employer index which i mentioned earlier has some suggestions about how you can improve um, initiatives such as like i said focusing on the areas with most need and then making sure you're removing any barriers such as cost from work experience programs. So if you and your department would like to host students, um, how can you make it easier for ones from students from lower income backgrounds to access that opportunity? Because no doubt it's a fantastic opportunity. Is it actually available to anyone and everyone who wants to take part? Um, a slightly longer term thing is also tracking the impact of the outreach activities. You know, do those students then end up um, keeping in contact with you? Do they apply for a, um, a further opportunity with your employer? Like Pierre mentioned, it's a good way to build that rapport and loyalty with people in your local communities. If your employer or um, team can even very ad hoc keep a track of that, it's really worth knowing whether you've had a really positive impact. And then finally, um, as an individual or as an employee, you can find a charity like, like the Social Mobility Foundation, and there are many, many others. Um, and give your time to mentor a young, young people. That could be work shadowing. It could be speaking on a webinar. It could be building a mentoring relationship. Um, that's a really great way as an individual to know that you are having a really positive impact on people who need it the most. And it may be something that many of you are already doing through things like being a STEM ambassador. Um, as long as you are aware of who you're impacting um, and either expanding that to reach others, um, then it's always going to be a positive thing, I think. Thank you, sir. Um, well, we're coming to the end of our webinar today, and while I do think that was a lovely note to end on, there are um, a few more little things to cover. Um, we have another question for our audience that should be appearing on your screens now. It's, what is your biggest takeaway from today, or what is your personal commitment um, regarding issues with social mobility in engineering? So please submit your answers via the Q&A box. But in the meantime, I'd like to invite each of our speakers to come forward and share their one key action they'd recommend to those of us who want to do more to address the issues surrounding social mobility and accessibility. Uh, let's start off with Helena. Thanks, Myra. Um, I think for me, it, it, that what you can do is partly impacted by where you are in your own career. Um, you know, everybody is always encouraged for STEM engagement. You know, it's so important. As Sarah's highlighted, you know, don't just think about going to necessarily your nearest school, the school you've been to before, um, but where you can have that, that greatest impact. If you're further through your career progression, think about whether actually you can facilitate 
for teachers to come into your organisation and to have that experience so that they can be educated about what engineering has to offer and they can see the broad range of opportunities and then they can educate for the rest of their career and um, the pupils who come through their schools on, on what there is to out there for them. Thanks, Helena. Sarah? Um, I would say my one key action could be that if you offer any ad hoc work experience or outreach activities um, to anyone who has a connection with your employer or industry, um, match that by offering exactly the same to a young person who has no connection. Thank you. Chrisma. Sorry, just uh, getting myself off me slightly um, distorted. Um, I think for me it is working. So I'm working in TFL at the moment, and I think just by doing this webinar, I think my eyes have opened up even further in terms of the how wide wide of a subject it actually is. So I think for me, what what I'm going to be taking away is sharing some of this information to my my wider community. Um, and I think with COVID, there's a lot more people that are using social media, um, and therefore using that platform, you can reach reach a bigger audience. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be taking away. Thank you, Christmas. Pierre. Um, I think I <laughs> alluded to this earlier on, and I think Helen has said it really well, but it's um, get out and go and find the areas near you where there is social need and go and see what you can do to help them and make it okay for the people around you in the workplace to do the same thing. Um, but you have to watch that people don't spend their whole day there, right? That's, that's the big watch out. But see what you can go and do to help and do it tomorrow and make sure everybody's got that in their work plans. Thanks, Pierre. And finally, Emma. Uh, thank you. I agree with everything that's been said, but I would add potentially that um, if you are working within an organisation, just ensuring that the young people who have taken different routes into their career have the opportunity to go out and talk about it because they're often going to be the role models or the person that um, someone from a disadvantaged background can relate to more. Um, so providing opportunities for them to go into schools or join a panel and, and share their stories are really important. Thank you so much. And coming in from our audience, um, we have um, Raphael's takeaway for today was to help people to progress with their career development at work by offering mentoring adapted to their technical background. And I think that's a brilliant, a brilliant idea. Um, in addition, um, the WES 50 a couple of years ago um, was, that's the Women in Engineering Society, by the way, um, and they give like 50 awards each year and the theme a few years ago was for current and previous apprentices who have succeeded in their careers and I think that's a big one to showcase how how hard it is and also how many success stories there are and once we get to a point where apprentices make up 50% of the top 50 engineers, um, that's when we will have truly reached some kind of equality. Um, you'll be receiving a short survey from us. So if you can spare a couple of minutes, we'd really appreciate it. Um, but finally, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all our panelists, the IMECI Yorkshire group who worked so hard to put this webinar together, but most of all, you, our audience, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye.